In this demonstration, I'm going to show how to update data to the Google App Engine app server that was uh, used in the last tutorial. So in the previous tutorial, we created an application here uh, where we can query the server, and it gets back the data that we put on the server. Now, I've added one extra button here called Post. When you click it, it switches to a new activity. Brand new activity that simply has the text here, a text field, and ability to click the Post button. When I click the Post button, we can see over here that I'm putting out a log message to show that we're actually executing that button. So what's that look like? Well, here's my Post button on my uh, UI inside of my IDE. And if I go to the layout of the simple post, here's the simple activity I've got. Now all I've got is this text field named txt data entry, and I got a little button which has the on click attribute set. So that's going to call the uh, the function on click post data inside of my code. So let's have a look at that. Inside my code, I've just created a function that is the post data. It takes in a view because that's what Android is expecting to call the function with and then I put out that log message that we're seeing down here. Fantastic, so let's figure out how to get data onto the server. So I need a few things for this. First, I need to know where to send the data. Next, I need to know how to send the data. And then finally, what data to send. So let's figure this out. Well, some of this we've had from before, so let me get it from my previous activity. I'm just going to copy across some of this server information. Now, it's the same server, so that's great. The file that we want to access is going to be different. We're going to access post.cgi. Let's call this the post file. So that's just building up the URL that we're going to work with. For a post, there's no um, URL encoding of any of the options, so I'll delete that. And so my post URL is simply going to be the server concatenated with the post file. So that's where to send the data. Okay, great. Now all I need to do is figure out how, what, and get the data there. So how to send the data? Well, the server is looking for the data to be identified with certain names. So when it comes in, it needs to be tagged with these particular values. So let's come up with those constants. Let's call it post option and app ID. I'm going to duplicate that. And I'm going to change the name. So instead of being post option app ID, let's come up with an item ID and finally a data, just straight up data. And the server actually is looking for the strings app ID item ID, and data, all lowercase. So this is what the server wants to know. And then finally, what data to send. So I need an app ID, an item ID, and a piece of data. Well, the app ID, we're going to use the exact same one we used before. Again, this is a global unique identifier that was randomly generated. So it's improbable that somebody else has come up with this uh, identifier independently. Now, of course, if everybody's following the same tutorial, we're going to have the same app IDs, and that's OK. This is just a demo. You will want to change your own to your own app ID. In fact, you may even want to make it specific to say something like, uh, you know, my demo, or whatever the app is. If you're writing uh, a named app, put the name in there just so it's easy to identify. So that's the app ID. What else do I need? Well, I need a item ID. So. Again, let's copy this with uh, Control Alt Down and Item ID. This is any string I like. I'm just going to use the string for two. So I don't know what data to send or what information to send. The one thing that's missing is the data. Well, that's going to come from the UI, so it's a text field or a text view. I'm going to cast it from the Find View by ID. And that's r.id. and text. Once I've got this, I'll import text view. I'm going to get the string. So I can call it .get text. Now this brings back the character sequence. It's not quite a string yet, so I'll call dot string on it, and that gives me the string to work with. So then I'm going to concatenate here with the data to send. 
So now my log is going to generate this and actually show me what information is being transmitted. I'll clear this, turn off scroll lock so it'll scroll automatically, and let's see it when it runs. So I'm going to go to post, type in some data here, and post the data. And there it is. Great. OK, so that's standard UI into the lock integration. Now what do I want to do with this? Well, effectively, I want to post it to the server. So let's come up with a new uh, file, uh, function. Let's call it post data to server. And I'm going to pass in all the information it's going to need. So that's the data. So we need the app ID. I need the item ID. And I need the data. Now the function doesn't exist yet, so I'm going to control 1 and let Eclipse create it for me. One thing I should mention up here, some of these are public, some of these are private for the constants. Uh, they could all be pr uh, private, it's probably an easier way to go. Uh, just some of them came in as public from the uh, previous activity. So now I need to transmit all of this to the server. So to do that, I've got to go through and construct the data to send. So let's do that first. Construct data object to send. So this is going to be a list of what's called name value pairs. Name value pair. And let's call this name value pairs. Now this is going to be an array list. It could be any other form of list you like of name value pairs. So I'm going to add to this. I'm going to undo a quick edit there that it happened, the name value pair. I'm going to add in a new, and I'm not going to actually add a name value pair. I'm going to add a new basic name value pair. This is a class that's defined that implements the name value pair interface, and it just provides the functionality for me. So to the constructor, I can pass in a name and a value. So the name is going to be these options we declared above. So for example, post option ID is going to be associated with the thing we wanted to call app ID. That's great. Now let's include some of these uh, imports. So import that. I like to do it one at a time just so that I can have control over it. That This is coming, you'll note, from org.apache.http. It's not part of the actual sort of core Android um, functions in the Android package, but it is included for us by default. So it's there for us. We can just use the app, Apache implementation, and we'll include list. Finally, I'll include the basic name value pair. Now I'm going to duplicate that with Control Alt Down again, and we're going to figure out the rest. So instead of app ID, I want the item ID, and I want the data. And of course, for each of these, I'm going to pass in the appropriate piece of information. So now I've actually built the object that I want to send. Let's bring in the objects that are actually going to allow me to send it. So HTTP objects. The first one is a client. I'll call it client. And there's a class called default HTTP client that allows me to uh, do a fairly simple HTTP interaction. Next, I'm going to come up with a post request. So HTTP post. Let's call it post. Equals a new HTTP post. And I can pass it in here a URL as to where we're going. So the URL I happen to have, we built it above, is the post URL. So now I know where the data is going, and let's import the appropriate client. Next thing is I'm going to have to build, um, encode what information I want to put in it. So give the objects the data. So I'm going to say post dot, and this is actually going to use the set entity. Now it needs a URL encoding, so new URL encoding of that information. And you'll see here it wants to take in a list that extends the name value pairs, which is great. That's exactly what we've got called name value pairs. Now, one thing that's going to happen here is it's going to throw an exception. So I'm going to surround it with a try catch. We'll handle these in just a minute. And I will move that down inside. So once I've constructed, I've set the data, I'm going to execute the post. So to do this on my uh, client, I'm going to call that execute. And then I need to pass it in what to execute. So execute the post. 
Now this is going to give me back a response, which I actually want to check and handle. So HTTP response, call it response, and then I'll catch that. And I need to, of course, import the appropriate class, and this is going to tell me it's also throwing an exception. So I'm going to surround it with try catch. It'll add it down here with the rest of my catches. So now I'm going to actually do something with the response. It comes back. I'm not yet processing. So handle response, and let's get it out. So the HTTP protocol returns a number. You can think of the status. So for example, 404, very common, is not file not found. We want to get that number. It's called status. And we can get it from the response by calling dot get status line, which gives me a status line, and then from that I can call get status code. And that actually gives me the integer of the status code. I can do the anything I want with it, so we're going to log it here. Log it with dot i, and put in the tag, and uh, post status is, and I'm going to concatenate it with the status. So that's kind of interesting. One more thing I want to do is let's put it on the screen. So let's use a toast. Toast.make text. Give it a context of this. Give it some text of post status. Concatenated with status. Duration is going to be the toast dot. Gives me the length of, uh, pardon me, I want length long. And then I'm going to say, please actually display this. Oops, pardon me, dot show. And that'll put it on the screen. So we're almost there. I also want to display down here instead of just doing a e and dumping the exception. Let's put it into log. So I'm going to put log dot e tag, and I can put in exception, and then pass it a throwable object, which happens to be e in this case. Oops, pardon me, log. And I'll put that for each of these handlers. Now you probably want to do something more interesting than simply logging it. Again, the client is not going to be able to actually see this when you're running it, um, for example, the end user. So you probably want to put something on the screen indicating the, the cause of the failure. And we'll see an example in a minute of what can go wrong with that. So let's just quickly check this over before we run it. We construct our data into something called name value pairs. We put all three in. We got the app ID, the item ID, and the data. I'm going to put the appropriate pieces of information for each. I create my HTTP objects, and then I'm going to encode my values into my post. I then execute the post, catching the response. This response I then process by getting the status code. I could get other things like text, I could get the data coming out of it, uh, but I'm expecting the server to only send back an OK or some sort of error indicating that something went wrong. I'm then going to dump that out to the log file and I will dump it out to the screen in a, in, a, in a toast. So I'll save that, I will control F11, and let's see if it works. So our app comes up, let's clear the display, and I'm going to query here just to see what we've got. Let's go to the post, and let's put some new data in. So new data goes here. I'll post it, and we see our post status comes up as 200. Fantastic. Let's go back and have a look at that. So I'll return to the previous activity, and I will query. And there we have it. 42 new data goes here. Now I want to show that this also is on the web. So I've got here my, uh, let me just clear off this uh, existing piece. So we can bring up the uh, server online. And then here I into it, I can pass in the item I, or the application ID. I'll switch back to Java and I'll copy the actual activity I, or the ID I'm using. App ID. Paste it in, and I can display all the data here. I can add a new one, so let's do 43, extra data, submit that, and I'll query here. Now we have the extra data. So we have one server that is accessible either through the web page or through my Android activity. Now, one thing that's going on here is if I were to call this again, to post data again, it's going to overwrite this 40, this data here. 
because if you tell the server you're going to use the same item ID a second time, it overwrites. So let's try that again. So my new data. I'll post. We get the OK. I go back. Let's clear it. Query and my new data. So it overwrote it. Now that may be exactly the behavior you want. Except one common thing that we're going to face is we'd probably like each client to have a notion of who they are, an identity. So how do we give a client an identity? We can't just hard code it like we've done here, otherwise everyone's got the same identity. We can't call everybody Bob, there's no differentiation. So let's come up with a unique ID. So this is going to be a string. Item ID is equal to, there happens to be a class called UUID, which gives me a unique ID, at least hopefully, and I'm going to call random UUID. Now that I can call to string on, and it's going to return the unique ID as a string. And so instead of using the hard-coded one, I'm going to use the unique one, unique item ID. So now every time I click the button for post, it calls this function, generates me a brand new, completely random ID, and we're going to put that, uh, use that as our item ID to be transmitted to the server. So let me run this, and we can see what happens. One thing to note is in this case I'm going to continually generate new IDs. In your real application you may want to store that ID to the actual um, shared preferences. So let's query, see what we've got. Just the four entries. Clear the display. I'll go to post. I'll come up with some new data. Hello world. Post it. Let's go back and query this. So here we can see it came up with a brand new kind of long uh, item ID. If I post a few more things, uh, extra, we'll just call it. I'll post this a couple times. Again, we can see the status OK. Click again, and I'll do it once more. Let me go back, clear the display, and we should have a few more extras. And here we can see the extra, extra, and extra. They all got tossed in. They happen to come at the end, this is sorting by the item IDs alphabetically. It's a string. And it just so happened that we generated a something starting with a 7, and another one starting with an 8, and another one starting with a B. That's not necessarily always going to be the case. So now we've generated them randomly. What I might have done is had this particular client generate a unique ID at startup if it didn't already have one, store it in shared preferences, and then every time I want to work with the server later, I use the one that's stored in shared preferences. That'll allow me to generate the notion of a persistent ID on my activity. So one last thing to do, I'm going to come back over here to the web browser, I'm going to refresh it, and now we see we've got all those extra pieces of information that were added by the Android client. Alright, well thank you for watching. Uh, good luck.